So, okay, well, we can uh, kick this meeting off. Um, this is Catherine Kramer, town planner. i um, excited to be taking over the controls for this TPZ meeting this <laughs> evening and uh, kicking us off with the roll. Um, so I will begin uh, with the uh, commissioners in alphabetical order. So Barbara Brenneman. Present. Patrick Carrier. Present. Uh, My Michael Gabralis. Here. Pardon for my pronunciations. And Matt Pogson. Here. Inez St. James. Yes. Yeah. Marcy Schwartz. I thought Marcy checked in a few minutes ago. Oh, she did as an attendee just now. Oh, oh. All right. Hang on. Where is the. Uh, so, uh, yep, under. And then attendee. So, oh, panelists. There we go. Um, Marcy, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Sorry, I must have said it incorrectly. Got you. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, next is Scott Halstead. Here. Uh, John Vibert. We should be, uh, be called in with his. Uh, so maybe yeah, this is. That's probably him. Probably yeah. Him. You're going to have to just allow to talk. And John, uh, you're going to have to unmute yourself. John, are you uh can you are you here? Hello, this is John. All right, Hello. great, thanks. And uh lastly but not least, uh Keith Vi Vibert. Here. Great. Thank you. Welcome to Catherine. Um a nice addition to our uh office. We welcome her with open arms. This is Barbara Brenneman speaking, Chair of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Will you please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to just make mention of a couple of things before we go forward with the call. There are a couple of changes to the agenda if you're looking at it. Um, number three under new business has been changed till February 22nd. And under the public hearings, um, West Farms has been moved to March 8th. So there are some changes. Um, Going forward, I'd like to have a call to order from our Secretary Inez, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Town of Farmington Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Notice is hereby given that the Town Plan and Zoning Commission will hold an online public hearing Monday, February 8th, 2021 at 7 p.m. on the following application. Highland Park Market, application for waiver for the sale of beer at 204 Main Street, BR Zone. At these hearings, interested persons may be heard. A copy of these proposals is online at https colon backslash backslash www.farmington-ct.org backslash government backslash town dash plan dash zoning dash commission backslash public dash hearing dash documents or call the planning department at Farmington Town Hall at 860-675-2325. Dated at Farmington, Connecticut, this 22nd day of January 2021, Town Plan and Zoning Commission, Barbara Benjamin, Chair, excuse me. Thank you, Inez. Moving along on the agenda to new business, Mark R. Cohen, a sign application for property located at 1387 Farmington Avenue. Mark, I'm happy to put up uh, your application. Do you want to speak to it? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. We can. Okay. Hold on. I think I just got muted. No, we can no, hear you. Oh, okay. 
sorry. So this is for changes to the canopy and the, the gas canopy and the pumps at the Valaro station at 1387 uh, Farmington Avenue. Uh, do, I, I'm not sure how this works. Do you guys, are you able to see the drawings and everything? Um, yes, up on the screen we have um, a graphic of the bonnets. Okay. I had other stuff with it. Um, yep, and behind it we have um, the pump. Mm -hmm. So all the information that you submitted with your application was sent to the commissioners uh, before the meeting. Okay, and the only problem is that drawing that you have up right now, that's not what's online. I'm on your website. That's a different drawing. This is what came in either with the application or the building permit, so is yeah. that fine? Yeah, so we, we, we revised it and um, uploaded that some time ago. Um, I can this describe what, what it is now. So that's the existing information. That, it's, that's, uh, that's correct. If you go back to the yeah. page before. So if the, we go to the first page. No, the, no the, pa the page you're on right now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the drawing that we have up on the, um, as, a, as an attachment to the submission, <clears throat> eliminates the Valero word mark with applied graphic that's on, that goes vertical on the column, that's no longer there. <clears throat> so that's not, that's not part of the application. <clears throat> and the other, the other documents that are on the um, website give uh, views of what the pumps look like now with measurements, as well as the new bonnet measurements. Oh, there, the, there it is. Okay, so this, this gas station has two pumps. So there's, well, four pumps, two, two, devices because you got you know one and two are back to back and three and four right now they have the existing bonnets which you can see the front of the view the three and one one and two and three and four they're identical with all the sizes of the copy and the bonnet itself and then the door skin which is on the bottom on the page you had previous to that it shows the new look yeah, almost there, right there. Now I had another page that gave a detail on the pump bonnet that you see with measurements. There, there's that. So there's a slight difference in the width is the same. The height of the new pump bonnet because of its shape is a little bit more. It's, um, wait, I gotta make this bigger. It's 22, thank you, 29 and a quarter inches. Uh, whereas previous it was 16 inches. The sides of the pump on it are concave. And um, right now, again, I have in this package, there's a photo of what the um, current side looks like, which just says self for, you know, indicating self-service has the pump numerals on it sideways. And uh, now we're eliminating that and just putting on the Valero logo. But I, I don't see that on this. Yeah. There's the front. Yeah. No, this. That's funny. Oh. The side, the PDF for the side is on the website, but it's not on this presentation. So the numbers at the end of the canopy rather than on the face of the canopy? Uh, the numbers are, um, yeah, the number panels are shown on the page that shows the full elevations. Yeah. And, and they go on the column itself. Okay. I, I'm not sure why, why all the pages aren't here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, this is the same, I, I don't. I don't know, but uh, that's fine. So this is, the only thing is the numbers for the pumps, really, that's the only difference. So the dimension of the bonnet's the same, the panel on the gas pump is the same. The door skin it's, is the same, uh, the, right, the, the panel, meaning the, the bottom part is the same size, obviously. Right. Yeah. 
So in the number, it's just a little flag, really. The numbers just... are a little flag. And then the other thing that doesn't seem to be there is the, um, the, well, you got the side details. I guess the other thing that, that, that is different is that the uh, column doesn't get um, the graphics, which I already mentioned. Right. So there's no graphics, but there's going to be a number. So the pump number is actually called out on that graphic. Yes, it a, is. Uh, so it's called out. So it's just it's a, a disk that's going to have the number. So you'll it's have a one disk. And that's, that's visible on the canopy detail that's, uh, I think it's above where you are right now. Okay. And the canopy is being repainted a beige color? Um, yeah, that's on the, if you scroll up to that, it, it gives you the call out for the paint. It's going to be a uh, tan color, actually. Okay. And no is graphics. No graphics. Okay. Hmm. That's on the website too, but it's not on this drawing, it looks like. Okay. Do you have anything else to add regarding this? That's, that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, it's just a swap out of the signs, swap out of the signs for the pumps, primarily. What was that? Okay. It's a swap out of the signage for the pumps. Yes, this particular application is for the pumps. Correct. Okay. Anything else to add? No, no not at this moment. Okay, I'll go to the commissioners for questions. Patrick? Um, uh, well, one comment. I think it's a great idea to see the, the number on the column. I, I feel like every time I go inside the store, I forget what pump I was at, so I think that's <laughs> kind of cool. Um, yeah, everybody does that. <laughs> so other than that, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's a... It's pretty straightforward. Is it? Um, it's not lit up, right? The old one's not lit up. The new one's not lit up. No, that's no, the only real question I have. There's, there's no illumination. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, it's uh, pretty straightforward. No questions for me. Other than that. Thank you, Patrick. Mike. No questions. Thank you. Matt. So uh, the only confusion I'm having is when I'm looking at uh, the one that's labeled page one of six. Uh, so I think that's the one above where you are if you scroll up right now. So we're looking at um, two per bonnet, and I think what I think the confusion is just that um, there's no view of the end of the pumps, and I think that that's what the picture on the right is telling us is that's what we're going to see when we're say pulling in. Is that correct? Yeah. What what it means by two per bonnet is that you have the front and the back, and and the left and the right. So the the, the detail that she just circled with her cursor, that's the side of the new bonnet. Right now, it's where, where the V is, the stylized V is. Right now, it says, it, yeah, it says self. And then the number one would be to the left, the number two would be to the right. That's being eliminated because the numbers are going on the column, as the fellow just previous to you, you know, commented on. Um, so two per bonnet means two logos, one on the left, one on the right. Then the same thing with the front. The, the, so pump one would have Valero on its side. And then when you go on the opposite side of the canopy to pump two, you'd have the same thing repeated. So all four hey. sides are being identified. Perfect. I appreciate the clarification. Um, besides that, I do not believe I have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Inez? No questions. Marcy? No questions. Scott? No questions. Keith? No questions. Thank you. John? Uh, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for presenting. We'll move on. Okay. Uh, we need a motion and a second on this application, please. 
This is in S. St. James. I make the motion to approve the application for sign application from Mark R. Cohen for uh, 1387 Farmington Avenue, uh, Valero Gas Station, as presented. May I have a second, please? Marcy Schwartz, I second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. What's the uh, next step? I'm sorry? Do I do something beyond this now, or does it just go no. through the... Oh, no, you've been approved. No, you're all set, Mark, and then we'll come back. I'll uh, hit your building permit tomorrow or the next day so you can proceed with the building department and your building permit, and you'll be... It'll continue then with the building review, and your building permit should issue uh, here shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to number two under new business, Depot Place Terminal Incorporated, referring to the Zoning Board of Appeals for use variance apartment use at 17 Depot Place per Article 5, Section 4B2. Ron, I open it up to you uh, if you'd like to present. We have your application on the screen. Hi, uh, Ron Dolly. <clears throat> um, it was my understanding when I purchased the property from uh, Willie Charette that uh, there was an, appoint uh, an apartment approved there. And obviously we got the building permit and we built it. Um, financial constraints, um, never finished it. So we'd... I, again, I didn't know it was not an apartment, um, so apparently I'm asking for that uh, ability. Okay, I'll um, I'll provide a little bit of clarification on this one. This is Shannon Rutherford, the assistant town planner, for the record. So. Uh, uh, as Mr. Dolly made reference to, uh, Mr. Charette is the previous owner of this building and in 2007 received a uh, variant to expand the portion of the building you see highlighted on the screen to go to a second floor. Uh, the roof had become in dis disrepair and so as part of the renovation to that portion of the building back in 07, they wanted to put a second floor up. So they had to go to ZBA to get an expansion of a non-conforming for a non-conforming building because obviously this predates our zoning regulations. And so they added a second floor to a building that didn't meet the setback requirements. Uh, it then, it was approved at ZBA to expand to go to the second floor. And then it went to TPZ and TPZ approved uh, the site plan, and uh, as part of that, as part of the discussion and what is captured in the meeting minutes, is this space was approved as uh, storage uh, slash an office type use. And uh, the front portion of the building, we've done a little research since then. So then we, re we recently received a building permit requesting to fit out this space as apartment, right? So now it needs a use variance uh, in order to be allowed to have this space as a, an apartment space uh, within a C1 zone. So uh, any use variances have to be referred for, uh, to TPZ for a referral uh, to give a referral to ZBA. So Mr. Dolly will be in front of ZBA next Tuesday, I'm assuming we get a positive referral from TPC. Um, so as part of all of this, we did a little history research in our <laughs> mm -hmm. the building office and in the zoning office. So not only did we go back to 2007 to figure out what had happened and how this had been approved and why there's a second floor, et cetera, and what the use had been approved for, uh, we went to the building files, and the building files uh, had a plan from 1993 that show the outline of the uh, 
the next one, the other one, that show that there's an existing parking uh, apartment space over the, I'll say the, as you're looking at this, the top right corner of the building. Uh, sorry, top left. I do that all the time. So there's existing par apartment space there uh, today uh, in 93. And it, it's historic. It probably it predates 1993. It goes back years. So now what Mr. Dolly is looking to do is the space in the top left where where we were looking uh, the first time, circle the first time. He's looking, that's where the new second floor went in alliance with the aerial. And that is where he is looking to put two additional apartment spaces. Um, so it's not inconsistent with the area, obviously. Um, it's just outside our Unionville Center, Unionville Village zone, which a mixed use with residential would be allowed uh, as a special permit use. Um, unfortunately, this area is still a C1 zone. It is mixed. Um, obviously, we've got a variety of uses down Depot Place. Um, and he's just seeking to be able to rent these as uh, apartment spaces rather than office or storage space. So that's the, the history on this. Like I said, we did I had to go through and tiptoe through some of our files to get the research. So, Ron, did I miss anything, or is there anything you want to add or expand on? Um, there's only a single apartment on the new second floor addition. Not oh, it's two. just one. You're okay. You're going to put one apartment in there, so there'll be a total of two apartments. Correct. One in the front and the and one in the back. back. Okay, that was my. I thought you were splitting that space into two oh, apartments. Okay, no. so one. One new apartment, two total. Okay. Got it. No, thank you. That clarification is important. Anything else you'd like to add, Ron? It's Barbara Brenneman. Hi. Hi, Barbara. Um, Hi. No. Um, we built it for an apartment. Um, it was inspected by the building inspector as apartment, or I thought. Um, so, again, um, we know Willie Charette, or some do. Um, <laughs> you used uh, to know Willie Charette. <laughs> oh, you, you, you had to know him. Um, yep. <laughs> anyway, so, sure enough, here I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to clean up some more Willie's um, deposits. So, okay. That, uh, really, that's it. Okay, Ron, I'm going to move to the commissioners and see what they have for questions. Patrick? Okay, um, yeah, presentation was good. I just was having a hard time following along on my own. <laughs> um, so you said the, so the, so right now it's already, um, what stage is it in? It's built as an apartment? Is, is it like in the frame stage? I, obviously, I know the second floor is there, the roof is there, all of that, but the interior, what, what, how does it sit now? Um, it's just rough framed. That's it. Okay, so so rough framed. So and when was that rough framed? Um, at the time of construction, um, back four or five years ago now. Oh, okay, so so four. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to understand. So. So it's not inconsistent, um, but it was framed rough framed four to five years ago, and and it just sat that way. Correct. Just okay. Money. <laughs> I got you. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, so when I'm looking at it, the office space B exists, office uh, space A exists, and then the apartment is up top. And then you move over and it's going to be another apartment. Um, maybe, Shannon, you go to the other drawing or is that not right? That one? Yeah. That's, you want that that's one or you want to go to the aerial? Uh, Oh, that's what we had built. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually, this is the view of the 2007, uh, well, the 2007 approval, and it was a 2009 building permit that's in our file, but I, I have no, I, when it was actually constructed and the inspections done, I would defer to Mr. Dolly regarding that. Um, 
So uh, do you want to go to the aerial real quick? Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's so this is where the you know you've got the shoe repair and the ice cream shop at the the front at the far left on the first floors, right? And then you come around the building and um, and then it's you've got the staircase. There's a staircase. I believe the staircase ultimately is enclosed. Is that correct, Ron? Yeah, that's an enclosed staircase going up up to the second floor. So. Okay, and then where where would the where would the parking be? Um, is it just right there by the staircase? Uh, yeah, there's six spaces there. Okay, I see. Yeah, I'm very familiar with it. I, now I understand. Um, yeah, that's it for me for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, no questions. The only comment would be uh, I'm fine with the referral. Um, there already being that one apartment there, as well as the. Uh, single family house on the southern section of that building there. Um, I have no problem with the referral. That's it. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just have a question about the procedural aspect of it because I don't think we've done this before. So I'm just kind of curious about uh, what exactly our role is. I know we're making this referral, but what exactly is that referral um, based on, is it, uh, is there a reason why we wouldn't refer it? Is there a reason why we would refer it? Because honestly, I'm not quite fully understanding that. So if um, anybody could clarify that for me on the uh, of the group, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So any use variances? This is Shannon again. Um, any use variances that come? So if it's a dimensional variance that comes before ZBA, um, then ZBA just addresses those. Uh, it doesn't have to come before the TPZ. Uh, but any use variances, and again, we're back to Article 4, Section uh, Section 4B2 procedure, and it says every application for variance from the use regulations as distinguished from the height and area regulations shall be immediately transmitted to the Town Plan and Zoning Commission um, uh, on or before the public hearing held by the Board of Appeals, uh, the Commission shall make a report with recommendation thereon. So this is uh, what that we're trying to do is make sure because the, the regulate this body crafts the regulation, right? Te technically, you're, you're responsible for crafting the regulation. Um, and so if there's a use variance, we want to make sure that you folks are aware and that it is not inconsistent or so inconsistent that the variance, uh, in your opinion, uh, should not be granted by the ZBA. Uh, again, as we've explained, that this, you know, this is certainly a unique location. Uh, it's right at the edge of our Unionville Center, Unionville Village District, which does have mixed use. Um, it's just outside of it, and clearly, just by the nature of the uses between the, um, you know, the ice cream shop, the shoe repair, uh, Farmington Continuing Education Building, there's there's lots of different uh, elements to Depot Place. There is already a residential apartment, and so it, in. In staff opinion, I wouldn't find that the addition of one more apartment was, uh, is incongruent with what is already being considered at this location. But that's really the question that's being posed by to the commission is, are you finding that this is uh, an acceptable use variance at this location because of the nature of uh, what is there and the uses that are there now already. Okay, I think that's fairly clear. Thank you very much. Then there are no other questions at this time. Thank you. Inez? No questions. Marcy? I have no questions, thank you. Scott? No questions, thank you. Keith? No questions, thank you. John? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Just a, a, a reference to this from me, Barbara Brenneman, that was an application made 
to the Zoning Board of Appeals that spells out its use and its uh, location in the neighborhood and what it's surrounded by. It's a matter of getting all this on record so that there's no challenge that like we're facing tonight trying to decide what to do about it, we don't want somebody else to be challenged by it 20 years from now. Um, so at this point, I would like a motion and a second, please, on this application. This is Inestine James. I make a motion to for a positive referral to the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for apartment use at 17 Depot Place. May I have a second, please? Mrs. Marcia, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolly. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and consideration. Okay, moving along, we'll move on to public hearings. Eliza Panette, application for special permit for personal no, service. I'm sorry, that one's off the table. Yep. Um, oh, don't we have to make a motion? No, to table? Oh. no it's automatically. I oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I thought we were. Okay. No, we don't have to. My do mistake. So we, no. Um, okay, the only call we're going to make, I thought it was like, you know, we were going to have to announce, announce the 22nd. Them. No, so that's, it's already been posted on the, the website. So both two and four are our okay. table. We'll go to number three under public hearings, Highland, Highland Park Market application for waiver for the sale of beer at 204 Main Street in a BR zone. Mina, I open it up to you if you'd like to present. We've got um, your application on the screen. Is there someone from the uh, Highland Park Market team? There's somebody with their hand raised. I think that's John. Oh. Yeah, okay. You can just unmute him for now, but yeah. Um, is there anyone on the call for Highland Market? Okay, and it's relatively straightforward. I'll leave it to the commission's discretion, but this is relatively straightforward. It's uh, it is something that the public would have a right to It hear. does have the right, mm -hmm. yes, but uh, as far as the application, they're looking for the right to sell beer at Highland Market. Mm -hmm. um, and it does require action by the commission um, and the waiver because it is within proximity to uh, another uh, liquor store that's yep. in right in the plaza and the one down the street. Um, we can always ask if there's public comment. If there's public comment that we can't address, then we can certainly, or if, if anyone. But the can, applicant is not here to make the application. Correct. Right? No, yeah. that's correct. They did do all their notice requirements. So mm -hmm. They did send all their notices out. I have a stack of receipts. Okay. They posted their sign. So maybe see if there's somebody. The public? So where do we stand legally then? Can we open this public hearing and open it to public comment without the applicant being here? <laughs> we probably shouldn't. You're right. Yeah. We probably I, shouldn't. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, if without the applicant, we probably shouldn't. Yeah. So. so the only thing at at this given moment, what I'd like to do is hold off on Highland Park Market. Um, move on to other business, the high school building committee, get that presentation done. Mm -hmm. If in the meantime Highland Market shows up, sure. we okay. can go back to it. Otherwise, it uh, Understood. Yep. doesn't get addressed. So we'll move on to under other business, high school building committee, there's an informal, a presentation being made to us and they are looking for discussion from us 
make this clear so that anybody here um, for public comment. There's no public comment on the high school. This is strictly mm -hmm. comment from the commissioners. Excuse me, Madam, Ma Madam Chair, it's Ines St. James. Are we um, not talking about Farmington Fuel today? Did that change? That's been Correct. postponed until the 22nd. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was the start of the meeting. Sorry, Ines. I, yeah, I, we had a bunch of them that uh, dropped off the agenda uh, last minute on us for a variety of reasons. Yeah. So we're going to have a, the commission is going to have a presentation um, on the high school building committee. And again, this is not for public comment. This is strictly for commissioner uh, conversation. Yeah, general information, yeah. right, because it will come before us for a site plan review ultimately. Who's running the? So Kat, Kat are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Um, so I, I actually would like to say anything before I press play. Yes, absolutely. I'd actually like to turn it to Meg Guerrera, who's the building committee chair. She just has a few words to preface this uh, presentation for you. Kat, Kat, would you please tell everybody who you are? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I'm Kat Krajewski, assistant town manager. Thank you. And you're referring the conversation to whom? Megan Guerrera, who's our building committee chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Megan. Oh, thank you so much. Everybody can hear me clearly? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, again, I am uh, Megan Guerrera. I am the chair of the Farmington High School Building Committee. <clears throat> um, just a quick intro, as Kat mentioned. So first of all, thank you to the commission for having us this evening. Uh, the last time we spoke with you was on April 15th of 2020. Uh, this was just prior to the High Farmington High School Building Committee being placed on pause by town council due, due to the unknown impacts of COVID-19. Although the building committee has continued to meet monthly in order to assess the impacts of COVID-19 on the proposed solution and the project overall, the project was officially removed from pause on January 12th. At that time, the committee was fully re-engaged and we are now working hard to review the new high school proposal and cost estimates with all of our stakeholders. As a reminder, at our last discussion in April 2020, we reviewed, we reviewed the project site plans, sequencing of construction, neighborhood impact assessments, including the berm along the, side, along the edge of the property, and a review of the public access ways. We prepared a video presentation for both the Board of Ed and Town Council that provides a high level overview of the new high school plan and cost estimate. And we're sharing that same presentation with you this evening as an overview of the project. I am joined this evening by both our architect and owner's rep. We will be available for any questions, answers, discussions, anything you might need after the presentation is complete. And at this time, we are proud to present to you the new Farmington High School. Um, Pam? Yeah, it's supposed to have sound with the video. Huh. Yeah, there there is sound with the video. This is Kat. I think on Zoom, there's a specific thing um, where you have to click to share your computer audio. Okay. Where it says, um, like on the, sorry, I just, Hold it up on the sh where you hit share screen. There's a pop up window that says share computer sound. Yeah. Share computer sound. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Try in the in the Zoom itself. Yep, I got it. Now I need to find the Zoom. Welcome to the Farmington High School Building Committee. Mission <laughs> of schematic design and cost estimate overview. Lost. 
found. found the report that it has developed a schematic design that meets the town council approved project scope of a new building designed by TSKP Studio within the net municipal project cost range of $105 to $110 million. This comprehensive new high school design has been achieved through the collaborative efforts of all stakeholders and focusing on the critical components of any project, strategy, people, process, and communication. We developed an overall strategy to meet as many of the items included in the Board of Education Statement of Needs as possible, while staying within the net municipal project cost range and eliminating educational disruption during construction. Our strategy worked and we delivered. This design addresses local, state, and federal requirements, consolidation of space, building systems, site improvements, and benefits to the community while considering fit and feel for the town of Farmington. Most importantly, this design meets the educational programming needs for our students now and in the future. Our goal was to bring the right people together to design a comprehensive solution that included feedback from our community and neighbors. We hired the right professionals and continually engaged with our district, town, and community partners. We adhered to a thorough design and review process that included evaluation of cost versus benefit and an understanding of optional design considerations and exclusions that limited our scope of work. Even through the required project pause caused by COVID-19, the committee continued to evaluate industry design and state legislative changes in order to adjust project requirements or the recommended solution. Most importantly, our work is nothing if it is not heard and understood by the community we serve. The FHS Building Committee has focused on transparent and timely communication before, during, and after the pause. We are committed to providing the information the Farmington community needs to make an informed decision at referendum. I would like to introduce Kathy Greeter, Superintendent, who will provide more details on the impacts of the building design and educational program. Thank you, Megan. The students and community of Farmington are disadvantaged due to the cost of maintaining the current Farmington High School's facility. Not only do we bear the economic ramifications of trying to maintain the current high school building, but the interruptions due to the constant repairs and inadequacies of our instructional space cost our children the educational opportunities they deserve. Facility issues impacting the quality of teaching, learning, and educational programming will be addressed within the new Farmington High School building design in the following ways. Advances educational programming and excellence. The new building design will increase the number of classrooms to accommodate current and future programmatic offerings within a flexible design which aligns with an exemplary 21st century education. In addition, the new high school facility will address currently undersized spaces such as the library, an adequate space for robotics, special education, science labs, and performance spaces. The new facility will promote collaborative workspaces that reflect the way students learn in today's and tomorrow's educational settings. Similarly, our auditorium and cafeteria will no longer be undersized for the population. These undersized spaces within our current facility are impacting scheduling, educational programming, and state and federal requirements. Fully inclusive and accessible. FHS must adhere to an Office of Civil Rights report indicating multiple areas of the current school facility that do not meet Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. Examples that will be addressed and fully accessible within the new facility are music spaces, the library, gymnasiums, classrooms, bathrooms, weight room, auditorium, stage, orchestra pit, outdoor athletic facilities, and all other spaces throughout the new high school facility. Promotes health, well-being, safety, and flexibility for the future. Rather than having a mostly one floor inefficient facility with narrow hallways that create overcrowding as students travel between classes with multiple entry points, the new high school design will maximize square footage to promote much needed additional instructional space with state-of-the-art security measures. New mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire alarm, and building protection systems will increase occupants' comfort and safety while eliminating loud and aging mechanical systems that interfere with learning on a daily basis. As a result, the new facility design will promote students' well-being and maximize learning. 
with the new FHS facility, we will no longer be on warning status by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges due to current serious facility deficiencies, including ADA access, heating problems, leaky roof, inadequate science, cafeteria, auditorium, library, and media facilities, and other facility issues that limit educational opportunities for students. Enhances learning for all Farmington students. Our students need open, accessible, inclusive, flexible, and future-ready learning spaces that promote independence as well as collaborative spaces to mirror real-world work environments, public spaces to showcase learning and display work, and quiet places for reflection. Technology and imagination rich learning environments foster a maker mindset, promoting innovation, creativity, well being, and all elements of Farmington's vision of the global citizen. The high school's new schematic design being presented within this PowerPoint mirrors what we know our students need today and in the future in order to maximize learning and success while advancing educational excellence in Farmington. Now we'll return the presentation over to our architects from TSKP to share an overview of the new high school schematic design. My name is Richard Sivek. I'm an architect and the principal at TSKP Studio for this project. Let's talk about site design. The diagram that you see on this slide shows the configuration of the Farmington High School site after the new building is built. The existing building is located on the western side of the site at the moment, in the area approximately where we show the 1928 building. Why did we place the new footprint in this location? Well, there are a number of reasons. For example, it can conserve resources. We don't have to disrupt a football field and we can save a portion of the existing building namely the 900 wing for use in the new complex. Secondly, it minimizes disruption of activities at the existing school. This new building can be placed in this location and construction activity minimizes disruption on the existing facility. And thirdly, it improves safety and security by consolidating the footprint into a compact shape and minimizing the number of entrances into the building. It also clarifies the traffic circulation around the building. The building design is very simple and clear. We showed you in the previous slide how the compact form of the footprint fits on the new site. This slide illustrates how the building will look from the outside. The upper illustration shows how the building will present itself to visitors. You can see that there's a minimum number of entry points. It's very clear. The entrance is right in front of you, adjacent to the administrative area on the left. The form is a composition of three-story classrooms and two-story supporting spaces. The exterior is constructed of very energy efficient envelope material. New masonry walls, glass, and roofing. New HVAC systems are included in the project also very energy efficient. And the materials we're proposing are very durable and easy to maintain, quite unlike your existing building. We're proposing exterior masonry such as brick, thermally broken glass walls, as well as uh, new windows and roofing. Farmington High School is more than a school building. It's also a public asset. Last year, we had public outreach meetings to get feedback from the public, and we've incorporated some of the features that we heard were necessary. First of all, we have a separate public access point, which is illustrated uh, in the lower right corner of this slide. That entrance is opposite the 900 wing that we're saving, and it's opposite the football field. This is the loud side of the building. This is where people can come in after hours to use the cafeteria or the gymnasium or the auditorium. On the opposite side of the building, is illustrated in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, is the eastern side. This is the quiet side, and this is the side that faces the neighbors. The only activity on this side of the building is academic, 
and there is no public access on this side. That pathway that you see is an emergency drive that's only available in case of emergency. So in this way, it's been very responsive to the needs of the neighbors. We are able to accommodate all of the spatial requirements that are listed in the educational specifications in the layout that you see here on the left side of this slide. This is a minimal footprint layout, and it divides very nicely into two halves of the facility. On the left side, or on the western side, are all of the large spaces, such as the gymnasium, cafeteria, and auditorium. And on the right side are all the academic spaces, such as the classrooms. The entrance into this building is in the low end of this diagram, where you can see that black triangle leading right into the main circulation corridor that leads you from the front to the back of the building. The after hours entrance is located on the left side where you see the other black triangle that leads directly into the cafeteria that serves as a lobby between the gymnasium area and the auditorium. The three-story configuration on the right is where all of the classrooms are located. These classrooms are larger and are flexible by having movable partitions in some locations. And as you can see, we've clustered these classrooms around breakout areas and faculty office areas. In this way, we've created learning communities, very focused learning communities. The interior of the New Farmington High School will be filled with natural light. By using skylights and clear story windows, we can bring daylight from up above directly into the core of this footprint, minimizing the need for energy consuming electric light fixtures. We're also planning to have ample circulation space so that students have space as they pass by each other from uh, classroom to classroom. The atrium space that you can see illustrated in the upper left side of this slide shows the ample space that's available and other activities can occur in this space. So in this way, it's more than just a corridor. It's also a multi-purpose area. In the lower left side of this slide, you can see the cafeteria space, a beautiful two-story space that also is filled with natural light. And this space, in addition to being a cafeteria space, also functions as a lobby. It's a lobby for the gymnasium and as well as a lobby for the auditorium, which are located on the opposite sides of this cafeteria. The finishes are easily cleanable, very easy to sanitize and very durable, such as porcelain tile on the floor. I'm Mark Gurilli, Project Executive for Construction Solutions Group. The following slide shows a brief overview of project costs broken down into columns from left to right with descriptions, original costs, and adjusted costs. The original costs were estimated in February of 2020, and the adjusted costs followed in May after the Town Council charged the Building Committee sharpening their pencil to fall within a targeted net town share between $105 million and $110 million. Beginning with the first two rows, these categories are costs required to complete the project but fall outside the direct construction costs. On the first line, we have the architectural and engineering fees at $5.7 million. These fees include all the work required to design and engineer the building, including certified consultants in specialized fields such as IT, commercial kitchens, and food services, universal design, etc. There were no adjustments to this line item in May. The next row incorporates all the professional fees at $3 million. These fees are also unrelated to direct construction costs and include such items as project management, testing and inspections required throughout the project, legal fees, insurances, bonding costs, etc. There were no adjustments to this line item in May. The third row indicates all of the direct labor, material and equipment costs related to the construction of the site, the new building, and the cost to dismantle the existing buildings, including the demolition of the 1928 building shown on the site plan. The original cost estimate was $120.6 million. After adjustments were made to the scope of work, the final direct construction costs came in at $117 million. Next, you will see the costs allocated for all of the interior and exterior furniture, program equipment, audiovisual equipment, as well as any other technology related items required to equip the school. The original estimate was adjusted down from 5.6 million to 5.1 million. The fifth row indicates dollars reserved for any possible unforeseen costs that may materialize during construction, 
these numbers were adjusted from an original 7.1 million down to 6.5 million. These numbers were adjusted to a new total project cost of $137.3 million. Next are the estimated state reimbursement costs. The town of Farmington is eligible to receive 20% of all costs related to new construction. The adjusted reimbursements equal $27.5 million, ultimately resulting in an adjusted net town share of $109.8 million, falling within the net town share target range, which you will see on the last line of the chart. I'd now like to turn it back to Megan to further review cost considerations. Thank you, Mark. It is also important to understand what is not included in our scope of work or the project budget. We will cover both optional design considerations and exclusions. Optional design considerations are additional items of work that were considered during the schematic design, but were determined by the FHS Building Committee to not be essential to the success of the project. These items are not yet part of the scope of work or project budget, but will be considered for inclusion by the FHS Building Committee in priority order as we manage the approved project budget. They include a motorized partition between gyms at a cost of $90,600, stone in lieu of masonry on the exterior of the building, $541,500, a softball field, $275,700, additional furniture, fixtures and equipment, and technology allowance, $420,000. Excluded items are beyond the scope of work for the Farmington High School building project and will never be included in the project budget. We are asking the Town Council to consider each excluded item and determine the next course of action for each. Understanding that the schematic design presented includes the demolition of the 1928 building, we have documented estimates of either mothballing the 1928 building at a cost of $1,042,300 or renovating the 1928 building at a cost of $9,821,700. Also for consideration, additional energy saving initiatives for $676,300, a net zero physical plan, $9,144,800, or Route 4 improvements, $763,300. In conclusion, the Farmington High School Building Committee believes that this new high school facility is progressive, advance the educational and community growth of Farmington. Many thanks to the Town Council, Board of Education, and the Farmington community for their continued work. Thank you. This is Barbara again. Um, I'd just like to make a comment. So many times over the years we've sat on this commission and felt we were not included, that we weren't made aware, that we weren't um, part of the process. And so I applaud the fact that we're seeing this now. Um, it's been presented to the town council. Um, and and for all of you on the commission, if you have anything you'd like to say, this is the time to say it, not that we're going to have any impact on anything, but it's important that each of us as commissioners feel like we're part of the process, and that's why it was important that this be presented to us also. Anybody want to make comments, speak up, or forever hold your peace? <laughs> Have any questions? There are people that we can get answers from if you have them. Patrick, Mike, or Matt, Inez? Yes. Mike or Bulls, I have a few questions and comments. Sure, um, come on. Uh, the first one. The first, it's a beautiful looking building. Um, just curious what the neighbor outreach was and, and how successful it was to the uh, Highlands neighborhoods that the new building backs up to. And let me start this again. This is Meg uh, Guerrero, Mike, um, just to give you kind of an update. Again, we're kind of re-engaging now after the pause, but just before we went on pause right around um, this April timeframe, uh, we actually did start a uh, neighborhood engagement group 
uh, specifically uh, focused on that Highlands area. Uh, we had several uh, Zoom calls uh, with that, that neighborhood. We actually engaged some uh, specific uh, volunteers to help us with it as a kind of focus group members as well. Um, we also have Sharon uh, Mazoki on our committee who uh, is a current resident uh, in the neighborhood as well as Johnny Carey around, a, around the corner. So we have some representation within the committee. We reached out to the surrounding neighborhood to really engage in conversation with us so that they could see the plan. We put together an entire neighborhood um, engagement presentation uh, for them to just to talk about the things that we knew were of concern, lighting um, uh, in parking lots, the berm uh, on that uh, side of the, the building and, and what that would mean to those neighbors closest uh, to the building. Um, so there was a, a very open conversation about that, that we expect to continue and reopen uh, once we have a decision uh, from town council uh, next steps around a potential referendum timeframe. So when we get that uh, additional information, we plan to re-engage that neighborhood focus and community group to continue the conversations with us, make sure they're right along next to us uh, with these conversations and uh, with the planning uh, so that we can hear the concerns and make sure that we can do the best we can uh, to 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 meet um, you know any 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 concerns they might have, come up with a, a, a proper solution. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Does that answer your um, yes, concerns? Yes, it, it does. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I just I, I know oh. that I know that it was out there that you know they were trying to meet with the neighborhoods. I was just curious how successful it had been. Yeah. Um, Anything thing, else? Yeah. The um, Obviously, the high school now serves as our, our primary shelter um, when needed. Um, was that any part of the process? Or uh, obviously, it's not the, the main thought when you're building a new high school. But was there any um, thought given to that? Any consideration that this will continue to serve as our primary uh, shelter when needed? This was um, definitely part of our conversations. One of the things we understood what I'm going to do is actually toss this right over to uh, Richard from TSKP to kind of help you understand a little bit more about how uh, this particular design um, meets those needs. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks very much, Meg. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Sivek. And um, the, the question of emergency shelter did come up. The term emergency shelter is a uh, a term that's recognized in the building code and the fire safety code, and we have to use that word cautiously. Um, in order to qualify as a shelter, it needs to be a higher rated seismic building. Uh, it also needs to provide certain um, resistance to hurricane forces. So I believe there are other emergency shelters in town. Uh, the high school itself though, can serve as a warming shelter, uh, as a shelter for residents if in case of power failure, they need a place to go, fill their water bottles, and those kinds of um, facilities could be made uh, uh, available to residents in those kinds of situations. Uh, for example, the locker rooms can be made available for those people who have lost water or power in their homes. They could. Um, um, spend the nights in this facility. The facility is zoned in such a way so that it's possible to have um, emergency power, for instance, to the cafeteria or to the kitchen or to uh, the places of assembly. So they could, people could come in and get oriented as to what emergency services are provided in town. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, I was just um, just curious if there was any input brought in from uh, emergency management or anything. That's all. So the anything else, Mike? Anybody else? Patrick, Matt, Inez, Marcy. I, I feel like uh, Richard got um, cut off. But... Sorry. So we we have had meetings with uh, police and fire in which we talked about. Uh, having the building secure, security around the site, security around the building, providing emergency access. We also had conversations about um, access to the site. And um, so we, we have definitely reached out to both fire and police 
and they've been part of the process. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Barbara, I have a question. This is Keith Ibert. Yes, Keith. Um, so, so um, again, about the, um, the the neighbors, as I look at just the overhead shot of the new building and then the current overhead shot, and this is you know really just comparing side by side the two pictures that were included in the presentation, um, it looks as though, I know that there's going to be a creation of a berm on the side um, closest to uh, like Crestwood Drive, I believe, that, that long shot where you're going to have the emergency. Right. Um, but it looks like you're able to fit everything into the current, um, I, I don't know if footprint, footprint's the right word for it, but the current layout of the building. Are you guys, is there going to have to be clearing of any of the trees over there or is it just the, the moving parts around to create that berm? Yeah, I, Richard, go ahead. I think this one's for you as well. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, so in fact, we are, in addition to placing a berm, along the eastern side of the property, uh, extending along the property line, uh, a very wide berm and a high berm, as well as a fence. We're also incorporating significantly more plantings. We're not removing trees, we're actually enhancing uh, the property with more plantings to provide screening along those neighbors. Great. I should point out also, um, you may re recall in my presentation, I talked about exposing the quiet side to the neighbors where there's no public access from that side. And the building placement actually creates a nice acoustic screen from the football activities. Yeah, I think it's just going to be important to remind people that, you know, there is no, uh, none of the, the coverage that they have currently is going away and that we're only enhancing. Because I know people are going to be afraid that the building is coming closer to the neighborhoods, but um, I think the way it's laid out right now makes sense to me at least for whatever that's worth. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. This is Inez St. James. Um, well, first, thanks for including the jazz band. That was a nice touch. Thank you. Um, does Monteith, that section going uphill, will, will that be um, re-engineered or repaved? Because that is kind of a hot mess when school is um, in, in session. Um, yes. But yeah, go ahead, Richard. Forget Thank it. you, Meg. Yep. Sorry, sorry, I, I should wait for you to... No, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, yes, uh, the project budget includes, improves uh, the Monteith Drive that connects Route 4 to the site. In fact, um, it's not quite two lanes wide right now, but people, when they're driving along either side of Monteith Drive, make it two ways, although it's not, not the safest configuration. So, the plan is to widen both sides of the median up Monteith Drive and to, in order to make it two legitimate lanes. It will be completely uh, repaved. The sidewalks will be made uh, appropriately accessible. So yes, Monteith Drive will be improved. That's awesome. Thank you. And um, I like everything we saw and we had a much detailed um, presentation before. I'm very happy you guys are back. Um, I know COVID times are different, but um, sometimes we go on hold and never come back and there's work that needs to be done. So thank you. What What is the time frame? Like when would this be going uh, in front of the town? I'll jump in on this one. And first to your previous point, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on, and I think the presentation does this, that, you know, there is a difference between um, changes and renovations to Monteith um, and a separate um, issue with anything that might need to happen at Route 4. And I think that I just want to make sure everybody's clear that was included in our um, exclusions uh, that we had in the presentation. But it is two separate things. And, and as of right now, any work to Route 4 is not included in the project that you see in front of you right now or the budget. So I want to make sure that's clear. Yeah. Um, the other piece, um, Inez, is, yeah, the timeline really is um, a little bit varied still. So. We are, our next step right now is to go uh, back to Down Council on the 16th. Uh, we have some additional work we need to do with them as far as some additional information and uh, provide an update on a, uh, hopefully, that people did see in their mailboxes. We put out a community survey. We're going to provide those results to them on the 16th uh, and hopefully start engaging in the conversation about a potential referendum timeframe. So, 
that referendum time frame, uh, which will then lead us to a date eventually, is really kind of the, the, the pivotal point for the remainder of the project. So the best way we can describe it is once that um, that referendum is set, and, and our hope is uh, that we would like to be looking at this potentially maybe in the spring, uh, in late spring for referendum, but again, that is, a, is completely up to town council. Uh, for them to gauge uh, the information that they have, uh, both community impact and financial, in order to uh, guide us around that time frame and that date. Uh, once that referendum date is set, then there is a cascading uh, timeline that, that falls from that date, where we would then talk about um, additional work around uh, detailed design um, and construction documents and things like that, that, that would then lead us into the next stage um, of actually working towards breaking ground. Um, so although that's not an exact answer, um, I would uh, what we need is just a little bit more time to get a solid answer from town council on their thoughts around that referendum date to really define a timeline that makes sense. Awesome, thank you. I, I can't wait, that's my <laughs> statement. I can't wait, we need this bad. Anyone else have questions? Uh, Barbara, this is John. Yes, John, go ahead. Uh, in the earlier designs, uh, both in the previous buildings and in this design building, uh, there's a lot of activity at, uh, in the classroom spaces to try to provide areas where small groups of individuals could have close conversations and collaborative processes, as well as normal seating. Um, since the pandemic's hit, uh, have there been any changes to that to keep people more away from each other that, as opposed to close in? Uh, before I toss it over to Richard, um, it, because I think he can talk a little bit more about what we've learned and what we've discussed from an industry uh, perspective, trying to bring that knowledge into our conversations at the committee level. I can tell you that we haven't received anything different as far as guidance from uh, the Board of Ed or any analysis as far as the overall statement of needs, which had required this flexible uh, learning capabilities uh, within this design. So from that perspective, we haven't seen any changes, but Richard, I don't know if you wanna provide what you've, any information or any kind of trends or anything else you've seen from an industry standpoint. Sure, a couple of things. So one of the points I made in the presentation is that we have a lot of flexible space and multi-use space in the facility. So you saw that we had corridors, but these corridors are wide and generous. They also function as atriums to allow daylight in an ample space for various activities to occur. We also have a cafeteria that's uh, placed in a location that allows it to be used all day long as flexible space. So you can have study groups appropriately distanced from each other um, and it also serves as a lobby for the auditorium and the gymnasium. But the fact that it's centrally located right near the main corridor atrium space makes it available for classroom scheduling or study scheduling as well. We do have large and small academic spaces. Um, and as time passes, I'm hopeful that um, we will be able to reuse those small spaces as well. Um, one thing that we are definitely including in the project is maximum ventilation. Um, we know that the best strategy for coping with the pandemic is with social distancing and with face masks. But the, you know, the building can certainly help reduce risk by providing proper ventilation. And so this building will have the ability to uh, purge air from the building that you could schedule a complete purge of air a couple of hours before it's occupied, for example. We are able to create separate zones so that we can have different groups, different cohorts without mixing air from one cohort to another cohort, and as well as um, high level MERV filtration and even ultraviolet irradiation of bacteria and viruses in the ductwork. So we're using all of the technologies that are available in HVAC detailing and planning to minimize risk. I hope that answers the question. 
Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Barbara, this is Marcy. And I, I'm just curious, there's a lot of discussion about windows and natural light. Um, any kind of solar or alternate energy resources being considered or part of the plan at all? Again, before I just toss this back over to Richard again, I think we have looked at a couple different um, options around um, energy. He can he can go into Richard can go into some more detail for you. We've I think what we've tried to accomplish here in this design is you know a cost effective solution that really makes this a very very efficient building. Um, but also understanding that there's more that can be done, but there's a cost associated to those things. And I think Richard can kind of share some more information on and kind of the different um, levels of energy efficiency and, and the cost around those. Yes, Meg. I don't know if it's possible to advance the slide to the cost slides. There are some options that are identified. Here we go. So the third line here that you see is additional energy savings initiatives. We were able to identify some uh, features that could be added to the building, such as ice storage, modular chillers. Um, and this is a way of getting more efficient electric consumption in the building. Ice storage allows you to buy electricity when it's off peak and then use the ice that you've stored in uh, air conditioning during the peak hours. So it's, it's a good way to shift the cost. Um, but the payback on that is 20 years, so it's definitely worth considering. Uh, there, there, but there is an upfront cost associated with that. The next line, the fourth line down, you see it says net zero physical plan. We did look at that. We did look at the possibility of adding geothermal wells uh, to the site. Uh, we would have to place them somewhere on the site. It could be under parking areas, for example. We also looked at the possibility of photovoltaic panels on the roof as well as on the site. But here again, there's a cost associated with that. Our estimate was that it was approximately $9.1 million to add those kinds of features. Uh, and the payback period is longer than 20 years. After 20 years, it's all gravy. But um, if the community is willing to add that cost to the project, that is definitely achievable. But um, full disclosure, that's not part of the basic cost. These are add-on features. Um, I, I, thank you for the answer. I'm wondering if there's any um, incentives that exist out there that we should be taking a look at. So um, there may be some incentives from the utility companies, but quite frankly, um, it's kind of a catch-22 because any incentives that you are able to obtain um, then get offset by reductions in state reimbursement for the project. Um, the state, when it calculates its reimbursement, does need to know whether you are getting from funding from any other sources and then they will reduce their reimbursement consequently. Um, you know what, you might consider these kinds of features in the future for the project. I think it's um, strategically, it would be wise to proceed with the project to maximize reimbursement. That's all I'll say, I'll say about that subject. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Inez, anything else? Or Marcy, anything else? No, that was the, that's it. Thank you, Barbara. I have I have a, a concern kind of question that has to do with during the period of construction. Where are you going to park all those cars that are parked now in the building site? <laughs> how how do we accommodate? the traffic of parked cars that we have every day today, when we're gonna take a lot of that parking space away while we construct a new building. Shall I answer that question, Meg? Yeah, yeah go ahead. We didn't actually um, highlight the uh, construction 
management portion. So go ahead there. Yeah, no, we didn't show that in this presentation, um, but we did do a phasing analysis at some point when we did when we tried to address this question with the building committee. And um, we are looking at included in the project would be a temporary parking area that's adjacent uh, just west of the library parking lot. There's a paved area for the library. Just west of that is a fairly level area which we're looking yeah. at as a temporary uh, staging area for parking. You can see in this aerial right here. Yeah. Um, that would have to be restored later, of course, but right. that, that parking could be made available for construction crews or who actually parks there needs to be worked out, but it is possible. Um, and then we have this multi-purpose um, practice field that's adjacent to the existing parking up on the plateau just yep. east of the existing building so the footprint of the new building would have to go in that area as well as some parking for construction crews we would have to displace the tennis courts unfortunately so those yep. tennis courts we're looking at the possibility of also being in that plateau area uh, on a temporary basis on a temp yeah okay Okay, kind of makes sense. Um, but just seeing the volume of vehicles that are going out of there every day, you know, it, I wondered if they were going to restrict car uh, student cars during construction uh, in any way. Um, and from groundbreaking to completion, what is your estimate of time? I mean, is it a two-year project, a three-year project? I, I believe the building itself would be 18 or 20 months, and then following that would be site restoration, so approximately two years. Two, two and a half years, yeah. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Um, Madam Chair, Matt Pogson, I have a quick question. Yep, um, sure. Based off of what Marcy had actually asked about, um, the I was very interested in the uh, uh, you know alternative energy uh, applications that could help to offset some costs, and that slide specifically um, showed a twenty-year uh, payback period, which just made me stop to think: what is the longevity of this building in general, and what thought was put into um, the growth, student growth here in town, and where, how long are we going to be able to use this building before it needs another expansion or something to that degree? Is that something, um, do you have numbers on any of that? We do. Um, we actually did, uh, obviously, an enrollment analysis uh, was done by the district overall, uh, which assesses out for uh, enrollments and increases uh, in the future. Um, but in addition to that, we also took a look at what was the potential. It did come up in conversations we had that, and it comes up because we have a building today that we have continually added to. So it's a natural question to ask is what if we do have to add to this building and what does that mean? So um, again, Richard, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about the analysis work that you guys did about potential um, expansion options to uh, the, the existing facility. Sure. So on our site plan, uh, it may not be clear in these diagrams, we, we had at some point analyzed the possibility of adding a pod of classrooms just uh, above the service area, which is located in that notch near the um, football field. Yes, in that area. And just below that, just below that, yeah, it's right there. In that notch, there's the possibility of adding a three-story classroom block in as well. So it is, it is expandable without having to increase cafeteria size or gymnasium size. We can certainly add um, classrooms in, in those locations. And that second part of the question was the longevity of the building itself. Like before things start to fall apart, how long are you thinking that uh, most of these items are going to you know, will they actually outlive that 20 years if you were to do any of that uh, alternative energy stuff? So geothermal will last um, the life of the building and the life of the building we expect would be about 50 years. Um, 
the photovoltaics tend to get less efficient after 20, 25 years. So at some point you're gonna to have to go through a replacement program. Um, they're getting better and better in terms of efficiency and longevity. But as of right now, you should expect to re start replacing them in maybe about 25 years or so. As far as the building systems are concerned, the foundation, the exterior walls will last the life of the building. Uh, finishes obviously have to be upgraded periodically. Mechanical systems, uh, you know, will last 20, 25 years easily. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Hearing none, thank you all for making this presentation to us this evening. We appreciate uh, your involving our concerns and questions and appreciate the time and effort on your part. Thank you very much. Thank you, we gonna, appreciate it. I'm gonna go back to our agenda to see if Highland Park Market has appeared. Okay. Anyone on the phone from Highland Market? Has anyone called in for Highland Market? If you, if you, if your uh, phone's muted and you, if you can't unmute yourself, raise your hand. No. All right, we made, I called and did an email, Bruce called and did an email. So the, um, the woman that's our contact, it's her, it's one of the Devaney's was supposed to be on the call, unfortunately, okay. this evening. So, um, well, we're going to leave that you know, those things unheard, happen, unfortunately. Yeah, unheard. So we'll have to uh, move that one. <laughs> so, okay. All I can say, folks, is rest up before the 22nd. I did my best to try to divide this out for us, but uh, you're going to get an early night tonight and expect to have a late one again on the 22nd. So. How about planner's report? We don't have anything to add for the planner's report tonight, but we'll have updates in the future. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the minutes. I would like a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the January 25th meeting, please. This is Ines St. James. I make the motion to approve the minutes from January 25th, 2021 of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission meeting. Is there a second, please? This is Matt Pogson, and I second that. I do have a question about the minutes. I just wanted okay. to ask. Um, so in the minutes, it references, uh, I have it on a notepad here, um, the intervener status was uni unanimous, unanimously, wow, uh, granted for the interveners. So it, according to that, we voted to give them the intervener status, but I thought that we were, whole, we were not giving them that until we had heard everything. So I was a little confused when I read through that. Did we grant them that status or are we waiting to hear to grant them that status? So we're, at, we're gonna take two votes on this. So the first one was the granting of the status. They need to be granted status in order to be allowed to make their per, uh, presentation to, uh, to the commission and so that it basically has equal weight uh, as the applicant, um, as opposed to uh, simply being uh, public comment, right? So public comment, you folks typically, typically aren't receiving reports and professional studies and um, an opposing, uh, strongly opposing um, views and opinions with respect to the technical information that's being submitted. So um, you'll get neighborhood comments and neighborhood opposition or in favor, but uh, typically not all the reports that have been submitted. So in order for them to have legal standing, you have to grant the intervener status. And uh, I think I'd noted in the agenda review that Bob DeCrescenzo had, had said, really, there's, um, it's been filed timely. There's no valid reason to not grant that status. Now, the second part will come 
maybe on the 22nd and probably into March. Um, and that's where you will vote and determine whether or not you agree with the claims that have been made in the intervener petition. So you would go back to the attachment that has the intervener petition, and in there, there are, I want to say six claims. It's under item three, so three A, B, C, D, E, F, E, and F uh, in, the, in the petition. And those are specific claims that they have made that they believe are uh, will have the likelihood to cause unreasonable pollution or harm to the area. And so that's their, that is the claim that they are making. And so once we finish the, um, all the, the hearing and, we, uh, and the commission comes to the consensus that we have sufficient information and no other information is needed, then we will close the intervener petition and we will close the applicant public hearing. And then you will have to make a determination first on the intervener petition and decide whether or not they have made their claim understanding that you these claims have to also fall within your jurisdiction as a town planning and zoning commission. And so there will be obviously a lot more detailed information regarding this. Um, there'll be information that'll be uh, put forth from our town attorney. I've been on the phone with Bob DeCrescenzo multiple times a week regarding this because we're doing the same thing. It's running parallel in inland wetlands. Uh, I think I had explained Inland Wetlands is about three weeks ahead of you folks. Um, so so this, there's two votes that are going to take place on this. And so that's, I understand the confusion and it is a lot to take in. And believe me, there's no intention on rushing you folks either. So anyone that wants more time as we're going along, there's questions and things need to be explained. It is going to be imperative that you speak up and ask these questions and make sure that you understand what you're voting on and why you're voting on it. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're in for, for a, a little lengthy lesson on, uh, on the legalities of intervener status and how we process these permits, um, but we'll, we'll muscle through this together. So uh, at any point, please don't hesitate to reach out. And Matt, did that answer your question? Yes, actually, it really did. Thank you very much. I, I guess I was thinking, to accept it meant that we had accepted it, you know, that we had actually, you know, taken it and the word can be used so many ways, but I understand how we, uh, it was used in that sense and I appreciate the clarification. So thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll go back to the minutes. There's been a motion and a second to approve as presented. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Um, just a comment on, on Shannon's explanation, and I applaud her for helping us as much as she does. Um, I just want to reiterate that when we talk about asking questions and looking for information, you have to stay within the commission. You cannot go outside the commission or what you're being presented. Um, you can't even talk to each other once we get into the hearing. Um, it, it's not our job to influence each other. We're supposed to be making decisions based on our own personal opinion on what we've heard and what we've learned and what we've been discerning about as we sit through a presentation. Um, it, it's just, we're, it's dangerous ice, that's all I want to say. Just make sure you're questions are within the commission and within the hearing and are to the applicants as they're being presented and not in the public. You know, it's supposed to have conversation outside that meeting. So, and I know I'm being an old grandmother about this, but it just 
you know, there's enough legal activity going on already on this application, and we need not um, stress that. So just remember that we're here to learn from the applicant and, and from the interveners, um, but we can't go beyond that. We can't go outside that. And with that final note, well, now I just want to Barbara. piggyback. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, you know, I just want to piggyback. I, I am not the public, right? So I, <laughs> while I live in town, I am not the public. That's right. I'm Switzerland. So when I say feel free to reach out, like you can call our office, you can yep. call and speak to Catherine or myself, and we're happy to to field Absolutely. these questions and assist. So if you're thinking of something or you want to you know, put it, throw an email because you're you're tinkering with something in the evening and that's when you think about it and you want to toss us an email, um, that's fine. So you're, you're free to coordinate with us freely as much and as frequently as you want. But not beyond that, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that point. But yeah, um, unfortunately, yes, we need to be very tight-lipped um, outside of, of this this group here that's on the on the call and, and your staff liaison, so. Yep. Anything Madam, else you want to talk Madam, about? Madam Chair, Mike Bulls, just a quick question for town staff. Um, if I had read correctly on Inlands and Wetlands, there's now a second intervener. Is that going to apply to us too? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the best I can tell you. You are okay. correct. There is second intervener petition was filed for inland wetlands that same uh, same homeowner and group has not opted to yet file a second petition here with TPV um, so that that remains to be seen it doesn't change everything a whole bunch it's just going to make it a little longer because again everyone gets their opportunity to present their case then great thank you you're welcome. Anybody else? You are adjourned. We'll see you on the twenty. We'll see you on the twenty second. Rest, rest up. Yeah. Everybody. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.